The following discussion is not necessarily the views of all involved. The goal is to start open and honest discussion in the Christian worldview. Like all things, weigh what you hear with what you know, and join us in our pursuit for the truth. Enjoy the podcast. Welcome to the Secondary Saints podcast. My name is Joshua, and there is no one to my left today. This is another solo episode of meditation, like the previous solo episode on the Satan. Um, and then because of that, it's just me. There won't be a, what have you read? There won't be the other boys talking and bringing in their sides of the story. Um, though there might be a follow-up episode on this in which they will get to talk. Um, but you just get me today again. And hopefully this episode is as good as the last one. It was received very well by you guys. And we thank you. Um, speaking of which, um, the reception is. You should check out our social media. You should check out our Instagram. We are on X at secondratesaints.com. Uh, you can also go to our website by that URL. We are on Spotify and YouTube and Rumble and Apple Podcasts, and you should check us out there. Please leave comments. Please talk to us. Please, if you go to our website, you can check out, you can message us directly, which is cool. And we like those responses. You can email us and we like responding to those emails. We like getting into those conversations deeply and hopefully that these conversations that we spur on this channel in this second rate saints community will, will cause further conversations in groups, in your friend groups, in with your friends and not so dissension and division within the church or within the world um, that it would bring unity and fellowship not chaos so with that we get into this episode as you can see from the title it is called the angel of the lord and that is the topic of today's episode um a much brighter topic than the previous episode and hopefully more glorifying to god because of that before we get into the actual topic we do have to go over some ground rules like we did last time which i think is wise and i want to keep doing with these episodes to remind people where their head should be at when they discuss mysterious topics. Cause a lot of these episodes are going to be on mysterious topics or topics that are on the fringe of Christian theology that tend to not get focused on. Cause they're not the main ideas like salvation, faith, how the church functions, how God functions with humanity, how creation works, all those things. These are these are side pieces that flavor up the Bible, and they are related to those things, but they're not the focus of those things. So like the Satan, or later we're going to do an episode on Melchizedek, who is a character that appears in a few books or is referenced. And those are in their own way, not the focus, but highlight other major ideas in the Bible. And this one is a major topic amongst those who like to explore the Bible for all its mysteries, who like to wonder what's going on in the angelic realm and with demons and other things. And so today we are talking about the angel of the Lord. So to get into these ground rules, this is what they are. First, don't immediately dismiss anything I say or you hear. And that's, that's just a good life rule everywhere, but don't dismiss it immediately. You can eventually dismiss it, but first listen to it and think about it. Don't just react to an idea. Ponder it, try to argue against it, defeat it, anything, but listen and think. And second, don't immediately agree with anything I say. Just like you shouldn't just disagree with anything you hear, you shouldn't agree with anything you hear right away. Uh, you should think about it. And finally, let the word of God be the final word. And as you hear in every one of these intros on our podcast, weigh what you hear with what you know. You shouldn't just let ideas go in one ear and leave the other. And you shouldn't just let these ideas manipulate your emotions and play on you. You should be the master of your thoughts, have some self-control. And so when you hear these ideas, check them in the Bible for yourself, because I'm going to be quoting the Bible a lot and make sure that I'm telling the truth. I would love to hear your thoughts on this in the comments, because this topic is so fun. So now we can get into the episode. The topic is the angel of the Lord. As I said before, he's mysterious. And part of the reason he's mysterious is because he behaves differently than the other angels of God. 
And so you're going to hear me say the angel of the Lord, and you might hear me say an angel of the Lord. And in the Bible, those things are different. And it should be known because the angel of the Lord, as we'll get into, has some interesting characteristics that differentiates him. And he's not like the other angels. He's also not like the other named angels. He's not like Michael or Gabriel, or as some would say, the third Lucifer, who, if you listen to the Satan episode, I said is not named Lucifer. That is a Catholic assertion from the Isaiah 21 passage where he is called Lightbringer and Lucifer is Latin for that. But that is, again, that's something he does, not a name. And so Satan is also not a name. It's a title. And so he's not like the other named angels. He's different. And we'll get into that. This angel of the Lord appears more than any of the others and has some surprising qualities. As we read through the references of him in the Bible and the other passages, we will start to see the pictures that the Bible paints of this picture, and they are wonderfully interesting. So first, here's some things you need to listen to. These are the characteristics of the angel of the Lord that as we go through, you will see and pay attention to. And this is what separates him from other angels. One is that the angel of the Lord and the Lord will speak interchangeably. Angel, everybody should know, is Hebrew, mal-ak, means messenger or angel. It's both of those words. And so that's why in the Greek, angelos, when you get into the book of Revelation and the seven letters, Christ gets John to send a letter to each of the angels of each of the seven churches. The angels of those churches are the messengers. It's not actually an angel, though there's some theological implications there as well. It's not an angel of the church. It's a messenger of the church. Angel and messenger are the same word. And that's because angels act as messengers of God. So that's the connection. But what's interesting, he doesn't just speak on behalf of the Lord. He speaks as the Lord. And so that slight difference there is important because the others don't. And then you get the angel of the Lord and the Lord will act interchangeably. In the passages, you'll see the Lord does something and then it'll say the angel of the Lord did that. Or the Lord, the angel of the Lord continues to do something that the Lord did. And that's important. And then also you'll see that the angel of the Lord will be worshipped and he won't stop people from worshipping him. Other angels will. Other angels like in Revelation will stop when John tries to bow down or people try to bow down to them. They will say, no, don't worship me. I'm not God. But the angel of the Lord doesn't stop people. Next is the angel of the Lord can do the wonders of God. There are many miracles attached to him, even the note of potentially the forgiveness of sins. And on top of that, you have the angel of the Lord will claim to have done things that the Lord did. Then we will also get the angel of the Lord will speak to the Lord. So he speaks as the Lord and he will speak to the Lord, which is an interesting note and will come up in the final thoughts. But with that, so those are the things you need to look out for. Then we're going to get into some passages and we're going to go through the Bible like we did with the Satan episode, all of the references of him and the references of some other characters, because they're all going to tie in. There is also a character called the angel of God. I'm going to argue that he is the angel of the Lord. It's just a different way of writing it. You're also going to get an angel sent by God who is also going to do the things that the angel of the Lord did. Or then in the passage, you're going to see, oh, he is the angel of the Lord. And then you've also got the word of the Lord who appears once and he acts and the angel of the Lord claims to have done what he did. And then the Lord appears in a couple passages as himself. And those things will be highly related to what the angel of the Lord does. And then in the concluding thoughts, we're going to get into the major controversy of this character and who people think he is. And that's where everybody gets interested in why this topic is so interesting, just beyond him acting for God. And so let's get into it. The first time we see the angel of the Lord is Genesis 16, verses 7 to 4. I'm going to read it out here. The angel of the Lord found her by the spring of the water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I'm fleeing from my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael. The Lord has listened to your affliction. 
He shall be a wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. And he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. So she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are a God of seeing. For she said, truly here I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore the well was called Beer Lahai Roy. It lies between Kadesh and Bered. So what's interesting about this passage, it's the first one the angel of the Lord appears in, Genesis chapter 16. Sarai tells Abraham to get Hagar out of here. And the person who appears to her is the angel of the Lord. And she says, so she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. So the person, she thinks that the person speaking to her, the angel of the Lord, is the Lord. And the angel of the Lord said to her, behold, I will give you a son. He shall be named Ishmael because the Lord has listened to your afflictions. And so he is giving a promise like God has done in so many places to other people where he is giving someone the promise of a future child. As God does working with an individual and bringing about their life in miraculous ways. And so that's cool. Then we jump to Genesis 22, and we get another interesting appearance of the angel of the Lord with Abraham's other son, Isaac. Chapter 22, 11 to 15. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you are, have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by the horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day on the mountain of the Lord, it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. And I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore, and your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. What I love about this passage is the angel of the Lord is the one that stops Abraham, and he says, You have not stopped from offering up your son, your only son. To God. And he calls out Abraham, Abraham, like we'll see in many passages, this is a thing that God does repeatedly, calls out somebody by name, a person responds, here I am, in that way. And then the angel of the Lord speaks on the behalf of God, as God, Abraham refers to him as Lord. And when the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time, he declares what the Lord says, because you have done this, I have, you have not withheld your son from me, your only son, I will surely bless you. And so you see that the blessing of the Lord comes from the angel of the Lord speaking on behalf of the Lord, who we already saw before speaks as the Lord, which is interesting. Now, we jump from Genesis 22 all the way to Exodus 3. Big jump. Now, we will go back to Genesis for the other passages, but I want to try to keep the characters going through the passages as the characters. So I want to go through all the angel of the Lord passages, then the angel of God passages, and then the word of God, because they'll, they'll tie in a picture in, I think. So Exodus 3, 2 to 4, you get, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. He looked and behold, the bush was burning and yet it was not consumed. Moses said, I will turn aside to see the great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come here. Take your sandals off your feet from the place from which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at the Lord. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of Egypt and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, land flowing with milk and honey. So now what's interesting is the angel of the Lord is the one that's in the burning bush, the one that Moses sees and from where the voice comes out speaking as the Lord. 
the one who again calls out Moses, Moses, like in the Genesis passage, Abraham, Abraham, the Genesis passage, it's the angel of the Lord speaking. And in this passage, it's the Lord speaking from where the angel of the Lord is saying the same thing in the same speech pattern. So that's cool. And then the Lord speaks and he says, I have heard the cry of my people and I will free them from the Egyptians, from all of the nations around them. And I will give them a land flowing with milk and honey. And that passage is going to come up again because the angel of the Lord is going to claim that he did that. So numbers 22 to 38 is our next passage. Now, this is a fun story. But it's important because it sets an image for the reader that I think is really cool. But God's anger was kindled because he went, and the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as his adversary. Now, he was riding on the donkey, and his two servants were with him. This is Balaam now. And the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand, and the donkey turned aside out of the road and went into the field, and Balaam struck the donkey to turn her from the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between the vineyards with a wall on either side. And then the donkey saw the angel of the Lord who pushed against the wall and pressed Balaam's foot against the wall. So he struck her again. Then the angel of the Lord went ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either to the right or to the left. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam, and Balaam's anger was kindled, and he struck the donkey with his staff. Then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey and said to Balaam, What have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? And Balaam said to the donkey, Because you have made a fool of me, I wish I had a sword in my hand, for then I would kill you. And the donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your donkey on which you have ridden all your life long to this day? Is it my habit to treat you this way? And he said, No. Then the Lord opened his eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand, and he bowed down and fell on his face. And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I have come out to oppress you because your way is perverse before me. The donkey saw me and turned aside these three times. If she had not turned aside from me, surely just now I would have killed you and let her live. Then Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. But I did not know that you stood in the road against me. Now, therefore, it is evil in your sight. I will turn back. And the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, go with the men, but speak only the words I tell you. So Balaam went on the princes of Balak. Then the words of God are put in his mouth in verse 38. And what's interesting about this passage is the angel of the Lord appears. God is angry in verse 22 and is kindled because he went. Balaam went to go help Balak. And then the angel of the Lord stands in his way three times on the behalf of the Lord, and he is also angry. So both him and God are angry, and the angel of the Lord opens, the Lord opens both Balaam and the donkey's eyes. And he bows down, he honors him, and yet the angel of the Lord does not stop him as if he should be worshipped, or as if he should be feared. And then not only that, but you see the donkey respects the angel of the Lord, as if in all of the Proverbs and all of the Psalms, when it talks about the rocks and the trees and the world crying out to God, that this donkey has calling out to its God, hoping that this, it's God in front of him, will stop him from his owner beating him. But then what's interesting is the angel of the Lord says, I will give you the words to say. And later on in the passage is when Balaam gives his oracles to Balak, they're attributed to the Lord, but they're the angel of the Lord's words. So that's interesting. So the angel of the Lord has a drawn sword. That's another note to keep. And then we will jump to Judges 2, 1 to 3. We've skipped some of the Torah and the book of Joshua. And this is what it says. Judges 2, 1 to 3. Now the angel of the Lord went up to Gilgal to Bochum, and he said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. What is it? What is this you have done? 
So now I say, I have not driven them out before you, but they shall become thorns in your sides and the gods shall be a snare to you. As soon as the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the people of Israel, the people lifted up their voices and wept and they called the name of this place Bochum and they sacrificed there to the Lord. So what's interesting about this passage is one, the angel of the Lord claims to have brought them out of the land of Egypt and swore to the fathers that he would give them that land. So he is the one that made the covenant with Abraham and he is the one that rescued Israel from Egypt. And now what's interesting here is if you're, if you're paying attention to the passages and the words being used and, and how scripture works, there's an interesting note that I'm just thinking about now is that they are now being cast out of the land. Israel, the land is often tied in with that Garden of Eden imagery. And so instead of being cast out for their sin, like Adam and Eve were, thorns and thistles will grow around them in the shape of foreigners and gods that will snare them, which is interesting because that's part of the curse is thorns and thistles. Anyways, that's an interesting image. But besides that, the angel of the Lord, that's a big claim that the angel of the Lord does what the Lord did in Egypt does what the Lord did with Abraham. And that's going to come up again. Then we swap to Genesis 6, 11 to 23. And we get the call of Gideon, which is an interesting story again. And it says, Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under a terebinth in Oprah, which belonged to Joash the Abizrite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat on the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you. O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, Please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all of this happened to us? And where are all of his wonderful deeds that our fathers were counted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the land of Midian. Do not I send you? And he said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, But I will be with you, and you will strike the Midianites as one man. And he said to him, If now I have found favor in your eyes, then show me a sign that it is you who speaks with me. Please do not depart from me here until I come to you and bring out my present and set it before you. And he said, I will stay till you return. So Gideon went into the house and prepared a young goat and unleavened cakes from an ephah of flour and meat he put on the basket and the broth he put in a pot and brought them to him under the terebinth and presented them. And the angel of the Lord said to him, take the meat and the unleavened cakes and put them on this rock and pour the broth over them. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord reached out the tip of his staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened cakes and fire sprang up from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened cakes. And the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. And Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. And Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace be to you. Do not fear, you shall not die. Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, The Lord is peace. To this day it shall stand at Oprah, which belongs to the Abriazite. So Gideon sees the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord comes to him in this passage, calls upon him to rescue Israel. Gideon calls him out for not rescuing Israel from the foreign nations. He's saying, hey, where's this God that did all these things in the Exodus? And what's interesting is the way the angel of the Lord is calling Gideon is the same way that he called Moses. You know, Gideon is saying, oh, wait, I'm just this, I'm a weak man, I'm hiding in a cave in the mountains, don't send me, I'm not significant. And God is saying, I can send you, I'm with you, I'm the one that makes men strong. But not only that is the angel of the Lord is speaking, and then the Lord turns to Gideon. So the Lord is present. Well, as we know, the angel of the Lord is sometimes referred to as the Lord. So is it the Lord is also present, or is it the Lord is the angel of the Lord and turns to face Gideon? Not only that, In that one verse, it says, Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. And Gideon said, alas, O Lord God, and refers to him by his covenant name from the Exodus. He looks at the angel of the Lord and calls him the Lord God. Now, Gideon could just be wrong. 
It could also be that he perceives that he's talking to the Lord through the angel of the Lord, which is another note that even if that's the defense, that's going to come up later. And I think that works into the idea that I have at the end. Then the Lord works through Gideon to free Israel from the Midianites. And that rest of the story is cool because this is also the first images you start to see of a king in Israel. And then we jump to Judges 13, 3 to 22. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, you are barren and have not born children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Therefore, be careful and drink no wine or strong drink and eat nothing unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God through the womb, from the womb, and he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. Then the woman came and told her husband, A man of God came to me. And his appearance was like the appearance of an angel of God. Very awesome. I did not ask him where he was from, and he did not tell me his name. But he said to me, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. So then drink no wine or strong drink, and eat nothing unclean. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Then Manoah prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, please let the man of God whom sent whom you sent, come again to us and teach us what we are to do with the child who will be born. And God listened to the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God came again to the woman as she sat in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. So the woman ran quickly and told her husband, Behold, the man who came to me the other day was has appeared to me. And Manoah arose and went after his wife and came to the man and said to him, Are you the man who spoke to this woman? And he said, I am. And Manoah said, Now, when your words came true, what is to be the child's manner of life, and what is his mission? And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, For All that I said to the woman, let her be careful. She may not eat anything that comes from the vine, neither let her drink wine or strong drink or eat any unclean thing. All that I command, let her observe. Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, Please let us detain you and prepare a young goat for you. And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, If you detain me, I will not eat of your food. But if you prepare a burnt offering, then offer to the Lord. For Manoah did not know that he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, What is your name, so that when your words come true, we may honor you? And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? So Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering and offered it on the rocks to the Lord, to the one who works wonders. And Manoah and his wife were watching. And when the flame went up towards heaven from the altar, the angel of the Lord went up in the flame of the altar now Manoah and his wife were watching, and they fell on their faces. The angel of the Lord appeared no more to Manoah and to his wife. Then Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to his wife, We shall surely die, for we have seen God. But his wife said to him, If the Lord had meant to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering at our hands, or now announced such things as these. And the woman bore a son and named him Samson. The young man grew, and the Lord blessed him, and the spirit of the Lord began to stir in Mahanedan, between Zora and Eshtaol. So this passage was long, but it's got a ton of interesting notes. First of all, the angel of the Lord, again, presents to a woman, you're going to have a son, like the angel of the Lord did to Hagar. Not only that, he presents that this woman will be the one that God saves Israel through, and that they are to offer a sacrifice to the Lord as a result. And I think this, this, this picture, it, it ties in so many things that we've seen is the blessings of children and barrenness being removed, of wonders and work being done by God. And yet, at, though they know he is the angel of the Lord, though they know he is not the angel of the Lord, the passage is telling you that this man is the angel of the Lord. Very interesting. And they say they will die because they've seen the face of the Lord. And then his wife correctly says, yeah, but if he wanted to do that, he would have done it. He would have killed us already. And so they stand strong. They've seen God and didn't die. And that's very interesting because many people, many passages in Exodus say that you can't see God or you'll die. And so that's very interesting. It's very interesting. So we make a huge jump from Judges all the way to 1 Chronicles 21, 1 to 15. This passage is another story, but it's, again, a very interesting story that adds way more information into it. So this is one of the passages I brought up in Satan episode because 
this is the second of the two appearances where it says God enticed David and now the Satan enticed David. And this is the second one. Then the Satan stood against Israel and incited David to number Israel. So David said to Joab and his commanders and his army, go number Israel. So they do this. They take a census of Israel and they find out that they have a large army, 1.1 million men of the sword and then in Israel and then 470,000 in Judah. But God is displeased at this thing because in the law, God said, do not take a census. You will gain your strength from me, not by knowing how many men or chariots you have. And so God is angry. And David said to God, I have sinned greatly because he sees that God has struck Israel. And he offers David three choices. You can have a plague. You can have famine for three years. You can have three months of devastation from your foes or three days of the sword of the Lord, pestilence on the land with the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the territory of Israel. David said that he would take the angel of the Lord to do that. And so the Lord sent pestilence on Israel with 70,000 men of Israel fell and God sent the angel to Jerusalem to destroy it. But as he was about to destroy it, the Lord saw that he relented and relented from the calamity. And he said to the angel who was working destruction, it is enough. Now stay your hand. And the angel of the Lord was standing by the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. And David lifted his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord standing between heaven and earth in his hand, a drawn sword stretched out over Jerusalem. And then David and the elders clothed in sackcloth fell upon their faces. And David said to God, was it not I who gave commands to number the people? It is I who have sinned and done great evil. But these sheep, what have they done? Please let your hand, O Lord my God, be against me and against my father's house, but do not let the plague be on your people. Now the angel of the Lord had commanded Gad to, stay, to say to David, and David should go up and raise an altar to the Lord at the threshing floor of Ornon the Jebusite. And so David goes and does that. Later on in the story, the angel of the Lord relents because of the making of the altar. For what he has done. What's interesting about this passage is, as we'll get in later, is the angel of the Lord is standing between heaven and earth, which is such an odd phrase. And I would think that that means that he's above David, above the earth, between the heavens, the sky, and the land. And I think that's where it's presenting. But for the people that are theologically inclined and read the New Testament, standing between heaven and earth, that's an intermediary. That's an intercessory stance. That's like Moses standing between God and the people. And what's cool about this is David is a messianic foreshadow. He is the king in which the future king will be like. Christ will be like David. And what you see is David is taking the responsibility of the sins of the people that God is judging, and he's taking it on himself and saying, judge me, not them. It's a very messianic image. And on top of that, he refers to Israel as sheep. He says, they're wayward. What have they done? Don't judge them. They're just sheep. And so the Lord of God stays his hand and the angel of the Lord does not wreak any more destruction, which is cool. And that image is going to come up again. And now we get two very prophetic images, Zechariah two times. So Zechariah 1, 7 to 17 on the 24th day of the 11th month, which is the month of Shebet, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, the son of Barakiah, the son of Iddo, saying, I saw in the night, and behold, a man riding on a red horse. He was standing among the myrtle trees in the glen, and behind him were red sorrel and white horses. Then I said, What are these, my lord? The angel who talked with me said to me, I will show you what they are. So the man who was standing among the myrtle trees answered, These are they whom the Lord has sent to patrol the earth. And they answered, The angel of the Lord who was standing among the myrtle trees and said, We have patrolled the earth and behold, all the earth remains at rest. Then the angel of the Lord said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you have no mercy on Jerusalem and the cities of Judah against which you have been angry with 70 years? The Lord answered gracious and comforting words to the angel who talked with him. 
And so the angel who talked with him said to me, cry out, thus says the Lord of hosts, I am exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion. So there's an apocalyptic image of beings that the Lord has sent to patrol the earth while Israel is in their 70 years of exile. And the angel of the Lord then speaks to the Lord and he says, how long will you judge Israel? How long will you be angry with them? Will you eventually free them as you have said? And the, and the Lord speaks to the angel of the Lord, comforting words, gracious words. And then the angel of the Lord relies to Zechariah what he has heard. And he says, cry out, thus says the Lord of hosts. I am exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion, and I am exceedingly angry with the nations that are at ease. For while I was angry but a little, they furthered that disaster. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I have returned to Jerusalem with mercy. And so he promises that rebuilding of Israel after seven years. And so the angel of the Lord speaks to the Lord and says, how long will you do this? And the Lord says, I'm done. The angel of the Lord asks God, speaks on their behalf and says, can this end? And it does. And so the angel of the Lord is that angel that talks with him. Because it says that there is an angel who talked with him. And then it says the angel of the Lord, who was the one that talked to him. And so ties in those, those phrases. And so then, so we get the angel of the Lord speaking to the Lord and then speaking on the behalf of the Lord and bringing good news. That's a way to put it that I didn't think about. Then we get another passage that we mentioned in the Satan episode, which is Zechariah 3, verse 4. But it's in that same image where you've got Jeshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and the Satan. And standing at his right side to accuse him, got that same image of the angel of the Lord is speaking. Sorry, the angel of the Lord and Satan are present. And then the Lord speaks. And so you've got, again, this conflation between the two. That the angel of the Lord and the Lord speak as one, but also to each other. And then in verse 4, you get, And the angel said, To those who are standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you and I will clothe you with pure vestments. So the angel of the Lord tells those in front of Joshua, the high priest, take his robes from him, for I have taken his iniquity. For I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you in pure vestments. So I have taken your sin, and I will clothe you with clean clothes. That's a powerful image that is going to come up later. Now. We're done with the angel of the Lord, per se. He's going to come up continuously, but we're now going back to Genesis and talking about the angel of God, who's a very similar character, and I think the same one. Spoiler. But let us read these passages. So Genesis 31, 11 presents us with a good image. Then the angel of God said to me in a dream, Jacob, and I said, here I am. But he said, lift up your eyes and see all the goats that mate with the flock and see all that are striped and spotted and mottled. I have seen all that Laban is going to do. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar and made a vow to me. So the angel of God calls out Jacob's name. Jacob responds, here I am. So again, you've got that same thing that the angel of the Lord did. Abraham, Abraham, here I am. Moses, Moses, here I am. And now Jacob, in between those two stories, the angel of God says, Jacob, Jacob responds, here I am. And then the angel of God says, I am your God, the one whom you made a covenant with. That covenant is the covenant that Abraham made with God, with the angel of the Lord. Big connection there. So I would say that's enough, but there's further passages. We then get uh, Genesis later on where Jacob wrestles with God. And it says this, the same night he arose and took his two wives, two female servants and his 11 children and crossed the ford of Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and something else that he had. And Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. And when the man saw that he did not prevail, Against Jacob, he touched his hip socket and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day is broken. And Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. 
And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. And Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask me my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. And the sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket. Now, this, this passage is, people wonder, is the angel God the one he's fighting or just a man or an angel? As per this episode, I think it's all three. I think the one that appears as a man is the angel of God. Is this angel that he fights God? And I think the, the relationship there is, remember the judge's passage. A man of God appears to them. They don't know it's the angel of the Lord. They find out it's the angel of the Lord. He goes up in a pillar of fire. They ask him, what is his name? And he doesn't give them his name the same way that he doesn't give Jacob his name when he asks. Right? So it's the same behavior. What is your name? Why do you ask me my name? Manoah and his wife ask him, what is your name? And he says, why do you ask me my name? It's, it's too wonderful. And so you've got those same things. They're both referred to as men, and they both speak as God, and they both they command the future. And so the angel of the Lord in Judges says, you, you will have a son, and he will be like this. The angel of the Lord tells Hagar, you will have a son, and you will name him Ishmael. This man says, I'm giving you a new name. So there's that name theology again of that changing someone's identity, making them into something. But again, that same man, angel, God connection. Very interesting. And then we get Genesis 48. And this is where Jacob realizes that this man, this angel was God. And so you've got Genesis 48. He's giving a blessing to Joseph and he says, the God before me, whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the boys, and in them let them my name be carried, and on the name of the fathers Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. He's blessing them and saying, may they have that same blessing that was promised to Abraham, Isaac, and me by God, that angel. That's a very big connection. That the angel he fought, that the angel that he made the, the angel of God that he made the covenant with, that that was God. Big picture. So then Exodus 14, we jump up and we get to Exodus 14, verse 19. So they're leaving Egypt and it says, the angel of God who was going before the host of Israel moved and went behind them and the pillar of cloud moved from the before them and stood behind them. So it's that image of wherever the angel went, wherever the angel of God goes, the pillar goes. But if we remember, the angel of the Lord says he carried them out of Egypt. He was the angel that was sent, right? So the angel of God, as we've already established, must be the angel of the Lord. So that's a quick one. But yes, he's the one that is in the pillar of fire. Then we've got Judges 13, 9. Again, we're back in Judges there's a lot of the same books that these, these characters appear in, which I think is interesting. It's probably because they're written by authors that had the same ideas. And we're back at the Manoah story because what you see is at Judges with Samson is when Manoah prayed to the Lord and said, Oh Lord, please let the man of God whom you sent again to us teach us what we are to do with the child who will be born. And God listened to the voice of Manoah and the angel of God came again to the woman. So the angel of God came again. The angel that came was the angel of the Lord. They're the same person. So that story is completely solved. But lastly, we've got Judges 6.20 that I skipped for some reason. And we're back at Gideon. And we get Judges 6.20. And the angel of God said to him, take the meat and the unleavened cakes and put them on this rock. And so you see again the angel of God the angel of the Lord being associated with the pillar of fire, being associated with going up in the flame of the fire of the altar of Manoah and creating the flame from the altar that Gideon makes. 
So the same three images, they're tied together. I think that's beautiful. And then we go back to the Exodus because now we're getting more of that imagery of this is an angel that the Lord sent. And so we're going to get, again, more of those connections between them. And it just continuously solidifies this idea that the angel of God, the angel of the Lord, the angel that God sent are all the same, but they're different from an angel. And that's important. I'm not going to go to all those verses because that gets tedious. Exodus 23, 20 and 21. Behold, I send an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place where I have prepared. Pay careful attention to him and obey his voice. Do not rebel against him, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. But if you carefully obey his voice and do all that I say, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. When my angel goes before you and brings you to the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I blot them out, you shall not bow down to their gods or serve them, nor as they do as they do, but you shall utterly overthrow them and break their pillars to place. You shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water, and I will take the sicknesses away from you. Okay, so we get God is sending this angel ahead of them, that he will guard them. He also has the ability to forgive sins. He will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. He could, but God is saying he will not. Big, big connection. Then you see that he will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. Well, later when they go into Canaan, that's when in Numbers, the Balaam story happens. And the angel of the Lord says, I am opposing you for you are going up against Israel. He's the angel that God is speaking of in Exodus 23. The one who speaks for him. The angel of the Lord has the ability to forgive transgression and to hold against sin. And then later on, we see in Zechariah that the angel of the Lord is able to do that. He says, I will take your sin and you will take these clean robes. Huge connections there. Then in Exodus 33, you get a beautiful image. I will send an angel before you and I will drive out the Canaanites and the Abbas. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. So I am sending an angel ahead of you who will be with you, who will speak on my behalf, who will be able to forgive sins, who will command you to do things, obey his voice. Huge implications. But I'm not going with you. The Lord is sending the angel of the Lord to go up and do these things. But I will not go with you because I will consume you. Because you're a stiff-necked people. Huge. Okay. I can't wait to get to the end to talk about the conclusions. But I don't want to spoil anything. But I feel like you already know where I'm going. Numbers 20, 16. And then... When we cried to the Lord, he heard our voice and sent an angel and brought us out of Egypt. And here we are in Kadesh, a city on the edge of your territory. And so Edom refuses the passage of Israel to go in. And Moses talks to their leader, the king of Edom. And he says, we cried out to the Lord and he sent an angel and he brought us out of Egypt. So again, that same connection. And I'm not going to spend much more time here. Second Chronicles 32, 21. And so Hezekiah is has a, an invading force from the king Sennacherib of Assyria. And this is a famous story of an angel destroying the army. And it says, And the Lord sent an angel who cut off all the mighty warriors and the commanders and the officers in the camp of the king of Assyria. So he turned with a shame of face to his own land. And when he came to the house of his God, some of his own sons struck him down there with the sword. So it's important to notice is that this passage doesn't say the angel of the Lord. This is one of those passages. God sent an angel. He wrecked devastation on his opponents. And that was it. It's one of many creatures that God has. One of many angels. And then we get into some interesting ones. So we go to Genesis 15, verse 1. And this is where we're, we're no longer in the presence of... We're not talking about the angel of the Lord or the angel of God. We're now talking about a few people that... Very interesting stories. Genesis 15, 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Fear not, Abraham. I am your shield, your reward 
shall be very great. And Abraham said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless and the heir of the house of Eleazar at Damascus. And Abraham said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look upon the heavens and number the stars. If you are able to number them, then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. And then he says, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur, the Chaldeans, to give you this land. So the word of the Lord appears twice in this scene and claims to be the Lord. That's interesting because he's present. It's not just the words. It's not just the Lord spoke. It's the word came to. The word of the Lord came to Abraham. And then you see in 1 Samuel, when Samuel is a wee little lad, if you listen to our Samuel episode, you will know this passage. 1 Samuel 3, when God is calling out to Samuel, Samuel thinks it's Eli. He thinks it's a human. But he says, now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. Vision, right? So. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. But then it says, the lamp of God had not gone out yet, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called to Samuel, and he said, here I am. Again, you've got that same idea of God calling out and somebody responding, here I am, calling them by name. But he thinks it's Eli. And it says, the Lord called again, Samuel, Samuel, here I am, if you've called me. But again, he thinks it's Eli. The Lord called to Samuel again a third time and he rose up, Eli, what's going on? And then it says, Eli realizes, oh, it's God. So he says, go down and respond to God. So you get as the Lord came and stood. Samuel, Samuel. See, now he repeats it twice. He's appeared. He's repeating the name twice. And Samuel responds, speak for your servant hears. That same idea of saying the name twice and responding, but it's the Lord who appears this time, not the angel of the Lord. But again, if it's the angel of the Lord appearing, and from those other passages, we know God saying that I will not be with you because I will consume you. Maybe what he's seeing is the angel of the Lord. We'll leave it at as it is. I'm not going to interject that immediately, but I think the pattern works. We then have to go to Daniel 7. And this is important because you get to see an image that is connected many of these ideas. And that's the famous son of man appears to the ancient of days. Daniel chapter seven. As I looked, thrones were placed and the ancient of days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames and its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him, and a thousand thousand served him, and ten thousands times ten thousand stood before him, and the court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. I looked then, and behold, the sound of the great word that the horn was speaking. And as I looked, the beast was killed, and its body destroyed and given out for burning with fire. And as for the rest of the beast, their dominion was taken away, and their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. And behold, with the clouds of heaven... There came one like a son of man, and he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and the glory and the kingdom and all the peoples and nations and languages served him as dominion is on everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away in his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. And so this is where I'm going to start tying in some of these ideas. So if you noticed, I haven't read anything from the New Testament And that's because the angel of the Lord, the angel of God, all of these characters do not appear in the New Testament, at least as presented in the Old Testament. You know that the Daniel 7 character appears because that's who Jesus quotes as himself. He says, I am the one who is like a son of man. On his trial, he says, you will see the son of man coming on clouds of power. That's that, that image that he's calling. And Jesus is saying, I am that guy. I am the son of man that is going up to ascend to his father and will receive the kingdom that will never end. That's the kingdom of God that he's been preaching. That is the gospel. And the ancient of the days is the Lord of heaven and earth. And so 
But I'm going to call up a thing called the Batman defense, which is, I think Jesus is the angel of the Lord. Many people will call us a theophany or a Christophany. Does the son of God, the second member of the Trinity, appearing in the Old Testament? Because as we know from heresies, he's not a created being. He's an eternal being with the Father from before time. So he's present throughout creation. We know from the New Testament that he was a part of the creation, that everything was made in him and through him and by him and for him, and that he has been working with God through all of these things. And the passage I'm getting at of why I think this is him is through a few ideas, not just that God, that Jesus, the Son of God, is present in the Old Testament, but that he's been acting in Israel's history this whole time. And if we jump to the book of Jude, we get a line that is very interesting. Jude, who is a half-brother of Jesus, says this. Now, I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed those who did not believe, and the angels who did not stay with their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling. So that first verse, verse five. Now, I want you to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus who saved a people out of the land of Egypt afterwards destroyed those who did not believe. Who was the one that led Israel out of Egypt? Who was the one that was in the pillar of fire that we mentioned? Who was the one that spoke to Israel, spoke to Moses as the Lord and said that I will lead you out of Egypt? The Lord said, I will send an angel that will lead you out of Egypt. And then that same angel in Judges talks about destroying Israel, right? We read the passages of the thorns and the thistles and the other gods that would come and constrict Israel and cause tripping, that they would fall into their sin. You've got that same image. Also, the angel of the Lord, as we read from the Abraham passage in Genesis, is the word of God that appears to Abraham and makes the covenant with him. Because we know that the angel of the Lord is the one who makes the covenant with Israel, as he says, and the angel of God does. And the word of God appears to Abraham as the one that speaks and makes that covenant. What we see is the connection of these characters. Jesus, by the claim of Jude, does these things. And as we know, the angel of the Lord is the word of God. But who's the word of God? The beginning of the Gospels, the book of John opens with John declaring to the world that Jesus is the word of God, the word of God that appeared to Abraham, the word of God in the Proverbs and the Psalms. And so I'm going to read John 1 a bit, and it says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him not Anything was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness was not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light. He came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him, but all who did receive him, who believe in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And he, we have seen his glory and the glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, this was he whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. So not only is the angel of the Lord the word of God, but John is declaring that Jesus is the word of God. The angel of the Lord, as I mentioned, has some traits that we need to remember, right? The angel of the Lord and the Lord speak interchangeably. So does Jesus and the Lord. The angel of the Lord and the Lord act interchangeably. So do Jesus and the Lord. The angel of the Lord will be worshipped and he will not stop them like other angels do. 
Jesus doesn't stop people from worshiping him. Not only that, the angel can do the wonders of God. So can Jesus. The angel of the Lord will claim to have done the things the Lord did. Just as Jude claims that Jesus did. Just as the gospels claim that Jesus did. Just as Jesus claims he did. And finally, but the angel of the Lord will also speak to the Lord. And that's a key one, is we see points in the story where the angel of the Lord speaks to God, but also as God, gives commands. And so we see that throughout the Gospels, Jesus not only speaks as if he's God, and people respond to as if he's God, he speaks on the behalf of God as his messenger, and speaks to God in his prayers. In, in the Garden of Gethsemane, in the high priestly prayer in John 17, Jesus is constantly speaking to his Father, constantly speaking to the Lord. And finally, in the Last Supper, Jesus has this line where he says, when you see me, you see the Father, right? And so when all these characters were speaking to God, what did they see? They saw the angel of the Lord, the messenger, the representative, the image of God present before them. Not only that, Jesus has the ability to forgive sins. When the man is lowered down from the roof, he is shown as being able to forgive sins. And that's one of the signs that the Pharisees are terrified of, because who can do that but God? The angel of the Lord does that, because in that passage in in Numbers, where it says, listen to him, he will hold your iniquity. And also what we see is Jesus in this intermediary state. He is the one that stands before God and man. He takes the sins of the world and gives us his righteousness. In Revelation, we see that image so clearly is where Christ takes our robes, washes our robes clean of blood, and makes them white as wool. Not only that, the angel of the Lord looks like a man. Jesus claims to be the Son of Man in that Daniel 7 passage. And when we read Revelation chapter 1, we get an image of Jesus in his glorified state. And it looks like the Ancient of Days. And we'll see. Let me read it quickly. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. On turning, I saw seven gold lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe, with a golden sash around his chest, and the hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were of burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars from his mouth, came the sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. I think, personally, that in the Old Testament, when people saw the angel of the Lord, someone like a man, when Daniel in Daniel 7 saw one like a son of man appearing to the angel of the Lord, appearing to the Ancient of Days, that they saw something not too dissimilar from this. Because this being that we know as Christ, because John says Christ appeared to him in this passage. And this being claims to be Christ. Also the first and the last, the beginning and the end. This guy looks like the Ancient of Days, but he's not the Ancient of Days. The angel of the Lord speaks to the Lord, but is not the Lord and is the Lord. Jesus is one with God and he's one with the Father, but he's also not the Father. The Old Testament has been giving us this image on how to think about Christ using the angel of the Lord. He is God, and he's not God. He is God, but he's not the Father. In this passage, this guy looks like the Ancient of Days, but isn't the Ancient of Days. This is where we get all the ideas for the Trinity. The Son is God, but he's not the Father. And what is the Son? He is the one who, when you see him, you see the Father. In that passage where the Lord says, I cannot be with you, but I will send an angel. Listen to his words, right? When the Lord speaks to the crowds later on in the Gospels, he says, this is my son. Listen to his words. When he's at the Garden of Gethsemane and he shows himself in his glorified state, shining like the sun at the transfiguration, God says to the three disciples there, this is my son. Listen to his words. Be careful to obey. The same thing he tells Israel to do about the angel of the Lord who will guide them out of Egypt, which Jude says is Christ. These are all the same character, 
but presented in images in different times and in different ways because the angel of the Lord is not the incarnate son of man yet. He is the son of God. He's not Jesus Christ as we see him in the gospels. He has yet to be born of Mary. And that's the important distinction. But he will be. And so that leads us to the end of the episode. And I want to read one proverb, Proverb 30, verse 4. And this proverb has stuck with me for a long time. And I think it's so telling. The final proverb, the final two proverbs are written by someone else than the rest of the proverbs. And it says this in Proverb 30, verses 1 to 8. It says, The words of Augur, son of Jekka, the oracle. The man declares, I am weary, O God. I am weary, O God, and worn out. Surely I am too stupid to be a man. I have not the understanding of a man. I have not learned wisdom, nor have I knowledge of the Holy One. Who has ascended to heaven and come down? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has wrapped up the waters in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and what is his son's name? Surely you know. Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. So I earlier have said, and I want to apologize for that. I said that the angel of the Lord is Christ. I don't want to directly say that. I want to say that the passage is leading you to that assumption. I want to say that all that Jude thinks that. I want to say that the Old Testament is presenting to you that this angel of the Lord is God and not God. He is, he is God and not the Lord. He is, it is this beautifully complex image. He speaks on the behalf of God. He speaks as God. He has the ability to do the wonders of God, and he has the ability to do wonders on the behalf of God. When you see him, you see God, just like Christ. But the Bible doesn't directly say that the angel of the Lord is Christ. And so I want to just hold off with a little bit of cautious wisdom, like this passage is saying, and saying every word of God proves true. I think that that's going to be proven true, but I don't want to add to the word. So I don't want to add that statement that the Bible is saying Christ is the angel of the Lord. So I want to hold off from saying that. But just like this passage says, what is his name and what is his son's name? right? The angel of the Lord said, why do you ask my name? It's too wonderful for you. But I say, just like the words of Augur, what is his name? What is his son's name? Surely you know. And that's where we'll leave it. Like I said before, look at our social medias, Facebook, X, Instagram. We're present on all of them. We'll communicate with you. Look at our YouTube our Apple podcast, our Spotify, our Rumble, and our website. Comment, discuss. This is a beautiful conversation. I love these conversations. Talk with us, discuss with us. We would love to contend with you. Iron sharpens iron. And I pray that God would bless you and that you would glorify him in how you discuss these things. And with that, just end it.